Dear fellow redeemed, many great people have walked the face of this earth. Some of them are known for wise things they have said. Others are known for their charitable or heroic deeds or for their amazing accomplishments in science, medicine, technology, industry. But of all the people who have ever lived on this planet, it is certain that there is no one who was so remarkable as Jesus Christ. Jesus spoke words such as no one before him. And to this day, there are many people who actually repeat the words of Jesus and don't even know who they are quoting. Jesus certainly had great accomplishments, did amazing things, so that people asked, who is this? Today, Jesus asks us to answer that question for ourselves. What do you say about Jesus? The same question he asked his own apostles, so many years ago. And we must confess, first of all, according to the word of God, that he is the son of the living God. In the Gospel of Mark, in this parallel account, his parallel account, we see that Jesus was far up in the northern part of the Holy Land, in the area of Caesarea Philippi. And he was there alone with his apostles. And he asked them a question. He said, who do people say I am? And the answer was interesting. They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, one of the prophets of long ago who has come back to life. Isn't that interesting? I mean, these people recognized that Jesus was someone very special. So special, in fact, that they concluded maybe he was John the Baptist who had come back to life. Maybe he was one of the prophets who had been resurrected. But the one thing that they did note beside that was that he was somehow connected with the people of God because Jesus was preaching God's word. And everything he did, he did in the name of the Lord. Yes, Jesus was an amazing person. But that is as far as many of the people wanted to go. He's a good man, some people said. He's a prophet, said others. But of course, Jesus is much more than that. You know, you've probably heard it said many times over. People like C.S. Lewis or Josh McDowell or other Christian apologists have made the comment that you can't just call Jesus a good man. C.S. Lewis said either he is a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. Because remember the claims that Jesus made about himself. Jesus claimed that he was the Lord and the Savior of the world. He spoke of himself as the I Am. That is the same thing that the Lord Jehovah said about himself when he met with Moses at the burning bush. Jesus was saying, I am Jehovah. Jesus performed signs and wonders. And he said, they come to me from the heavenly father and they point to who I am, that I am the Messiah. Jesus spoke of himself as the Savior and said that he was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets, that he would die as the scriptures foretold, that he would rise again as the scriptures foretold, that he would take away the sin of the world. And I am, I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me, said Jesus. Jesus received worship and accepted it from many people. People such as the Apostle Thomas who fell down in front of him and said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus would have certainly had opportunity to say, oh no, you've got that wrong. That is not what he said. Jesus made these fantastic claims, amazing claims. Jesus gave great promises so Jesus cannot simply be called a good man because either Jesus was a liar and everything that he said was not true and he made all of this stuff up and he tricked people with sleight of hand and illusions and faked his own death, faked his own resurrection, caused his apostles to put their pens in motion and write fantastic things about him and then all be martyred for him on his behalf. 
or else Jesus was a lunatic. He was crazy. He really thought that he was God. He really thought he was the Messiah. And he even tricked himself with miracles and signs and great words. But you can't just call Jesus a good man because either Jesus was a liar or he was crazy or else he is the Lord. And he's the savior of the world. And that is not only the conclusion that Peter came to, but the one that we must come to as well as we look at the Bible and what it says. Because when Jesus asked Peter, who do you say I am? He said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus commended him very highly. He said, you're right, Peter. That is who I am. But it is not flesh and blood that revealed it to you, but my father in heaven. You could not know who I am and come to the right conclusion on your very own simply by reasoning it out and saying, yeah, that all kind of makes sense. I guess I'll go with that. He said, your heavenly Father has revealed it. The Holy Spirit comes to us through word and sacrament and through the power of the gospel converts our hearts to know that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And so that is our conviction. So that from the heart we confess that he is the Savior of all. He is the Christ, the Son of God, and the Savior of a dying world. Now, Luke's gospel account does not record this part of this occasion, but the gospel of Mark does, and all of you are aware of it. That right after Peter had made this great confession and confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus praised him for it, then Jesus said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. He must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, the Bible said, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> Peter had great intentions. From a human standpoint, we can understand why Peter did not want Jesus talking that way. He loved Jesus. Jesus was his friend. He had been with Jesus for three years. He had seen his miracles. He had heard him speak. He got to know Jesus very closely. And he was now trusting in Jesus as his Savior. But suddenly Jesus is talking about being arrested and being mocked and being crucified and dying. And you can imagine how hard a pill that was to swallow for Peter and the rest of the apostles. And so Peter was going to try to dissuade Jesus and talk him out of it. Jesus, don't talk like this. This is so morbid. Why are you throwing a wet blanket over all of this? Why are you raining our, on our parade? Talk about pleasant things. Talk about good things. But the Bible says when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, and you remember his sharp rebuke. Get behind me, Satan. Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. How wishy-washy we can be. But we all understand as sinners how this happens. One minute we are so strong and we are taking our stand on Christ and the next minute a slave girl walks up and says, aren't you also one of his followers? And we, like Peter, on the night of Jesus' trial and arrest, say, I don't even know who he is. Ah, how weak and sinful and frail and wishy-washy we are. But Jesus had to say to Peter and to all of those who were there with him, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Jesus said, if you are going to be a follower of Christ, there is a cost. Not a cost to pay for salvation. Salvation is free. But the cost of being a disciple of Christ means that you are going to have to bear crosses for the sake of Christ. As a believer, there are certain burdens that you are going to have to carry as a direct result of being a follower of the living God. Remember, a cross is not merely pain or suffering or some disaster that we have to endure or some hardship that we have to go through. A cross 
is something that we have to suffer or bear up under for the sake of being a Christian. Whether it is being ridiculed or persecuted. Whether it is peer pressure when we want to do the right thing but the world is trying to lead us astray. Whether it is taking a firm stand on the word of God even when others will not. That is a cross. St. Paul says that everyone who lives a godly life in Christ will suffer persecution. To a greater or lesser degree, all of us will have to bear up under the crosses that we have to bear for being Christians. And no one will escape. But I'm not saying that to frighten you, nor did Jesus. He was saying it simply because it is true, but in the same breath, Peter should have heard these words. I am going to die, but I will also rise again. <laughs> and that is our comfort. Jesus Christ rose from death and he proved that he conquered Satan's sin and death. Jesus promises that the victory is already ours. No matter what battles we have to fight, no matter what kind of crosses we must bear up under, we have already won the battle through Jesus Christ who lived the perfect life we could not live and died on the cross bearing our sin and guilt and then rose from death to prove that our sins are forgiven. Yes, there is our strength and confidence. When you look at the life of Joseph and you read that story of Joseph, Joseph resisted temptation against Potiphar's wife. But you read over and over and over and over in that account, and sometime read it, maybe when you go home today, how often it says, but the Lord was with Joseph, 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 and he is with you and me too. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Therefore, why should cross or trial grieve me? Because as we sang in the hymn, in the opening of this service, Christ is near with his cheer, never will he leave me. He is with us to the end. Jesus said, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? What good would it have been or done for Peter to talk Jesus out of going to the cross? It would have meant that none of us would be redeemed. None of us would be saved. Jesus had to go to the cross. He had to suffer and die. But he did this so that he could deliver us from sin, death, and the devil. Remember, Jesus didn't come here simply to be a teacher of good morals. They've, there's never been a shortage of teachers of morals in this world. And you don't even have to go as far as Christ. Buddha, Confucius, Mohammed, Plato, and Aristotle. Even Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, taught morals. So what? <clears throat> but if you seek freedom from sin and guilt, if you desire to have a right relationship with God, if you want to know that you have eternal life and a place in heaven, then look to Jesus. Because when Jesus says to you and me, but what about you? Who do you say I am? We can say you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you are the Savior of a dying world. May we confess this and never be ashamed to confess the name of Christ, for it is he who took our shame away. Amen.